I'm going to read just two verses from Micah chapter 2, but keep your Bible open to that place. We find the gospel in these Old Testament books, but none of the prophets present Christ and his work and the gospel, uh, the gospel call more clearly than Micah and Isaiah. They were contemporaries and many of their writings sound very, very similar as you read them. But we want to see from these two verses which we lift out of the chapter because there is a great transition that takes place between chapter 11, or verse 11 and verse 12. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But he goes from pronouncing judgment to announcing mercy. And he does so within the space of one verse. All of a sudden, he was talking about judgment and then suddenly he's declaring the mercy of God. And that's not unusual for these prophets to do. We find it throughout the minor prophets, but especially here in the prophet Micah. Let's read these verses. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Basra, as the flock in the midst of the fold. They shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of them. The breaker is come. The breaker is come up before them. We want to see who this breaker is. That ought to be capitalized as we think about it, who he is. The breaker is come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gate and are gone out by it. And their king shall pass before them and the Lord on the head of them. Their king and their Lord passes before them. Their king and their Lord is the same with the breaker who breaks down the brass gates and delivers his people out of their judgment. That judgment is God's strange work and that his delight is showing mercy that is a precious and well-established truth which we are often reminded of in Scripture. But I don't think any place you'll find that more clearly seen than right here in the striking text that we have read from Micah chapter 2. The prophet was delivering reproofs. He was in the midst of that well-deserved reproofs to a very sinful people. You read the chapter and you'll see what brought this on and why that they were under such rebuke and reproof. They had straightened the Holy Spirit, as you see, or tried to. Of course, you can't do that. But they had tried to straighten the Holy Spirit. They had refused to hear the messengers of God. And so the well-deserved punishment for their sins was being announced by the prophets that they refused to hear. To our surprise, in the very midst of the threatening, as I've pointed out, he delivers a prediction brimming with mercy. Not only is not the Lord straightened, but even his people, the people of the Lord, are not to be straightened, and he will see to that. One has come forth who shall be both to them a liberator and a leader. Judgment, we know, is God's strange work. And he delights, even in the midst of threatenings, he delights to turn aside to utter gracious words to the obedient. Surely the brightest, I believe the most silvery, the most glittering mercy drops that distill upon the sons of men have fallen in close connection with storms of judgment. That is the way God works. In our Lord's mission, in coming into this world, 
The acceptable year of the Lord is side by side in the same advent as the day of the vengeance of our God. As the judgment of God is preached, it serves as a foil to set forth the brightness of the glory of his grace. Now in the case here, the thunderous words of the prophet stay their course, if you will. And in mid-sentence, it seems, as he inter is interposing a passage of promise that is rich and gracious to this undeserving people, the people that he's denouncing, the people on whom he's pronouncing the judgment of God and assuring them that it is going to come, that he's going to sift them like grain. He's going to scatter them, as Hosea says. Jezreel, I'm going to scatter them to the four winds, as it were, to all the nations, but especially Babylon. It is this passage that I wish to open up this morning, as the Spirit of God will help me. Certain willful persons were proudly confident that no enemy could reach them behind their walled cities, but the walls of their cities Though the Lord had declared that he would make Samaria a heap, the northern capital, and that he would strip Jerusalem, the southern capital, they coveted fields, as we see in the first part of this chapter. The leaders would lay on their beds at night, thinking of ways that they might confiscate the property of others. And so these willful persons proudly did their dirty work while they were confident that no evil was going to befall them, no judgment was going to come, as though there was no day of reckoning for them, as though there was no judge in all the earth. The Lord warned them again and again, assured them that they must not expect to be preserved from chastisement just because they claim to be the people of the Lord. You notice earlier on, he says, O thou that art named the house of Jacob. You take that name upon you, but you're certainly not acting like my people. This house of Jacob, this remnant of Jacob, the remnant of Jacob is seen as the true people of God, his chosen. But he said, you take the name of Jacob upon you. Just like there are those who have a name that they live, but they're dead. So these were not living up to their name. But they continue to boast that the Lord would protect them, that he would be with them. They were saying, is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us because the Lord is with us. They were saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are we. While they were committing the most heinous of sins and crimes against their widows and orphans and those that were helpless, coming up with ways, devising schemes by which they could confiscate their property, even if it put them out in the street. They would be carried away into captivity. This was coming. The prophet had been announcing it. And yet the word, these would, there would come a day in which they should be gathered. And all the prophets, they do the same thing. They announce that judgment is coming. You'll be taken away into captivity. God will judge your sins. But here, as he's talking about their judgment and their well-deserved judgment, all of a sudden he breaks into that, as I said, mid-sentence and announces something altogether of the mercy and grace of God that he's going to bring them back again that he's going to regather them. True, the, the Lord forgets not to devise means to bring again his banished ones. 
He had to do that with all of us. We were banished. Now the words of Micah in our text agree with many others. For it is the way of the Lord to restore his chosen in the day of their repentance. And make, make certain they would not be restored except for their repentance. But we know from reading the other prophets, uh, Zephaniah for example, that there were those in Babylonian captivity, they longed for the assembly, they mourned for the sacred assembly of the saints. They wanted so badly to be able to go to the temple, worship God again, but their temple had been destroyed. And they were in captivity. But here the prophet announces that God is going to bring them back. And we know that God did bring them back and they rebuilt their temple. And he restored them to their land. Now I have no doubt that the fulfillment of this prophecy in the near fulfillment of it was given when Cyrus conquered Babylon and gave permission to the, to the Israelites to return from their captivity, to go back to the land. He gave them orders to do so and gave them help in doing so, instructed the people to give them offerings to help them and do everything they could to help them. This is Cyrus as he has conquered Babylon. Cyrus can be regarded as the breaker here. Seeing what Isaiah wrote about him, and I want to remind you of that again, what it was that Isaiah wrote, I, again, Micah's contemporary, what he wrote concerning Cyrus. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus. Why does he call Cyrus his anointed? Well, in one sense, all kings are his, and he put them in their office so they wouldn't be there. It is God that raises up kings. It's God that brings them down. So all kings are his anointed in that sense. But this is in a different sense. Cyrus is here so clearly a type of the anointed one, God's true anointed, the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who truly came down from the north and conquered Babylon and set the people free, opened the brass gates. But listen, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leave gates, and the gates shall not be shut. And I will go before thee, the Lord is going to go before Cyrus, and make the crooked places straight, and I will break in pieces the gates of brass, and cut in sunder the bar bars of iron. What is he saying? Isaiah is predicting many, many years before it happens. He is predicting that Cyrus, who isn't even born and will not be for another 150 years, names him by name and says that he is going to come back down from the north and he is going to conquer the mighty Babylon and he is going to open those brass gates and he's going to break them is what he's going to do and set his people, God's people, free. He therefore is God's anointed. So I have no doubt that the first fulfillment of our prophecy here that Micah gives us is Cyrus and what Cyrus did. And we know from Ezra that something else that we see here, there's going, they're going to come with a great noise by reason of the fact that there's a great multitude. Ezra, who records the return of the people under Cyrus, there is a great rejoicing, great shouting, a great noise that is heard as they come back, and especially as they're laying the foundation of the temple. A great noise is heard, great celebration, great rejoicing. How many Bible students see yet another fulfillment of Micah's words in a latter-day regathering? 
uh, a conversion of the Jews who will lament their fathers, what their fathers did in ignorance, and they shall gather to Christ. They will look upon him whom they pierced and they shall mourn for him. And so all Israel shall be saved, Romans eleven twenty six. They say it was for this that Christ prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But even so, I do not necessarily see it that way, but even so, this could not begin to exhaust this prophecy, which Micah uniquely predicts here. It is a prophecy concerning the gospel gathering of the remnant of Jacob. It is Micah's prediction of the gospel gathering of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he will gather them as his sheep. He will gather them like a flock. And he will deliver them and he will guide them and he will lead them and he will put them into a flock like the flocks of Basra. This is unique, uniquely Micah's uh, prophecy of this very thing because of the analogy that he uses is unique. None others use that analogy. Amos, for example, he says that God is low. God will sift you as corn in the sieve, but not a grain will fall to the ground. Not a true grain. Not one of God's own. Not one of his elect is going to fall to the ground, even though they will be sifted like wheat. The chaff will all be blown away or burned but the true grain will be saved. That's the way Amos describes the same thing. Hosea says there will be Jezreel. There will be a scattering, scattering into captivity. Among the nations they'll be scattered. But the word Jezreel also means a scattering in lieu of a future harvest, a scattering of seed that in the future is going to be harvested and all of the grain is going to be brought into his garners. That is the description that Hosea gives of this very same thing. Both of these are wonderful. The scattering that God does in judgment, even in judgment he's remembering mercy because he's going to regather the true grain. He's going to bring it back. He's going to reap the harvest. And of course, these things set forth the gospel day in which the true harvest is going to be gathered by the gospel and all of the grain is going to be brought into his garners and we'll be brought back out of that captivity. The brass gates, those gates of judgment, brass speaks of judgment. They'll be broken. They'll be shattered. And the king, the breaker, the one that breaks through the brass gates, he will lead us forth and he'll bring his own, all of them into the fold. And he'll be their shepherd. He is their shepherd and they'll be his sheep. So Micah's prophetic eye saw the gathering together of all of the elect of God, the true Israel of God, as Paul identifies them in Romans chapter 9, they're not all Israel that are of Israel. He tells us in another place that the circumcision of the heart, it's, he is not a Jew that's one outwardly, not in the spiritual sense. He is a Jew that's one inwardly by the circumcision of heart. Paul could say we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. We are the true circumcision. He was a Jew, but he was including all of the elect, all who are saved under the gospel. We're the true circumcision, whether we're Jew or Gentile. The line in which the Lord has determined that the covenant blessings 
should run was ordered by divine sovereignty. We know that that is true. It's not in Ishmael, it's in Isaac. It's not in Esau, it's in Jacob. It's a glorious spectacle here that is set before our eyes. It's something to behold. And I hope that the Lord will give us all eyes to see and hearts to rejoice in this sight. What the prophet Micah is really saying here concerning the church, concerning Jesus Christ, not Cyrus, but Christ himself and the church that is gathered to Christ. First of all, see the flock as it's gathered into the fold there in verse 12. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. There will not be one missing. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, Jesus said. Him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. The Lord shall count when he writeth of the people. They're all there. John chapter 6 makes it sure not one of them shall be lost. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Basra, as the flock in the midst of their fold. They shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of them. The sheep to be gathered have wandered into the uttermost ends of the earth. They've been scattered as Hosea says, they've been scattered to the nations. You'll find Christ's sheep, true sheep, in every nation of every kindred, every tongue on the face of this earth. That's why we send out missionaries to find them, to preach to them, to bring them into the fold. Who knows where the sheep have wandered? Who knows where they're gonna be found? All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned everyone to our own way. The sheep are scattered, yet they're his sheep. He has purchased them. He could say to the Jews, you do not believe on me because you're not my sheep. But his sheep did believe on him. They would hear the gospel and believe. Some of these are of Israel. Most of them are of Gentiles. In fact, the prophet Zechariah pictures it as 10 to 1 Gentiles over Jews, actually greater than that. One would be found on the cross next to the Lord Jesus Christ. Who would have thought those two thieves, that one of them was Christ's sheep, and he'd be caught, called and brought into the fold at the last hour of his life. There he was. One was found with his weapon in his hand at the foot of the cross. The one that says, surely this is the Son of God. Now we don't have absolute positive proof that he was a believer, but that was the confession that John required. So I believe that he was converted right there with his weapon still in his hand having participated in the crucifixion of Christ. One of these sheep was found almost 60 years ago in southwest Missouri, rural southwest Missouri, wandering aimlessly. But there's where the Lord found me. There's where the good shepherd found me and brought me into the fold. Where were you when the Lord found you? He has his sheep scattered all through the earth. And they are being brought to him through the preaching of the gospel. It's been going on now for a long time. Some of these sheep are lost, still lost, while they're sitting in church houses. Maybe some here today. You're one of that Christ has purchased with his own blood and yet you're lost and you're outside the fold. Oh, that God would bring you in today. The Spirit of God would draw you in today. Even in churches like ours, some can sit right there and hear the, hear the truth, maybe agree with it. 
but they've never come in. Come on in, the water's fine. May the Spirit draw you in. Maybe one lives next door to you. Let's go looking for them. Our text gives us a very in, the very encouragement to do that. Go find the sheep wherever they be. And bring them in. We sing that song, don't we? Bring them in, bring them in, bring them in from the fields of sin. That's what we're to be doing. Christ's sheep are certain to be gathered unto him. I say certain to be gathered. I will surely assemble. And then he repeats it. I will surely gather. And in Genesis 41, where Joseph interpreted the dream of uh, Pharaoh. And he said it was a double dream because this is of God and it's going to be done shortly. It's going to be done certainly. And here we find, I will surely assemble. I will surely gather. I will put them together. That's an I will. That's sovereignty speaking concerning the hold that sin has on sinners. This is a tremendous encouragement. We see some down in the ditch, some of those sheep, some of those lost sheep, entangled in the briars, bound by the habits and addictions of sin, and they can't break them, they can't get out of them, seemingly given over to sin, buried in dark depression many times. We need to take the gospel to them. We need to tell them about one that can set them free. We need to tell them that Jesus will bring them into the fold. He'll nurture them. He'll take care of them. We see some of these sheep on the high mountain, proud, self-confident. They don't need the Lord. They have need of nothing. We sing, I need Jesus. They say, I don't. I don't need him. I'm sufficient in and of myself. And no, you're not. We see some of these sheep in situations of grave danger. We see them ready to perish. But he also sees them. That is the, that's the key. In Matthew chapter 18, it was the Lord Jesus, that good shepherd, that left the 90 and 9 and went out to find the one that was lost. Lost, lost on a mountain of sin and despair till Jesus in love sought and rescued me there. He saved me from wandering, gave me release. Showed me the pathway of, led me in pathways of blessing and peace. There's no ifs here. There's no maybes here. The double sure. I will surely gather. I will surely assemble. I will not fail in what I've set out to do. I say that gives us great confidence as we go out with the gospel, seeking the sheep, that we might bring them in, that he will not fail to bring his sheep home. Christ's sheep shall be gathered in unity. I will put them together as the sheep of Basra, known for the folds of sheep. Only the Lord himself can bring so diverse a people. We've already talked about how that they are scattered all through the earth. They speak different tongues, they're different nationalities. There are different stations of life. But he will bring them and put them in his fold. Do you not realize that in Christ there is no Jew, there's no Greek. There's no bond, there's no free. James tells us that there's no such thing as master and slave in the church. They're one. 
He brings them in unity. Doesn't matter how rich they are, how poor they are. None of these things matter. Christ's sheep shall be gathered in unity. They will be like the, the folds of Basra. I think it's cause for concern when we see in the local assemblies there's not much evidence of this unity. So many times those that name the name of Christ seem to be more happy with friends in the world rather than in the church. They seem to be more content when they're in the places the world goes rather than the house of God where the word of God is going forth and where God's people gather and in sweet fellowship. Christ brings all people from all points of the globe, all nations, all kindreds, all tongues. He puts them together in his fold. We love all the people of God. Doesn't matter what their color, it doesn't matter what their nationality, it doesn't matter if they're, they live in a, in a hovel or if they live in a mansion. The fold of the Lord's flock ought to be a happy, secure, family dwelling. Christ's sheep shall be gathered in great number. I like this, they shall make great noise by reason of the great multitude of them. The redeemed of the Lord may at any given time, will at any given time be a minority in the earth. We are now, no doubt about it. But do not think that we are few. There is a number that no man can number, as the sand of the seashore for number, as the stars of the heaven. So shall the seed of David be. Great multitude. What a noise of singing and shouting shall be heard. We talked about how that the people in the first fulfillment of this prophecy came from Babylonian captivity to rejoice and shout and their voices were heard for miles as they rejoiced and praised God for their deliverance and for the prospects of this house of God being rebuilt. But that's just a, that's almost nothing compared to what it's going to be in heaven. I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. That's what it sounds like in heaven. There's rejoicing, there's shouting. And it goes on to say that the time of the marriage of the Lamb has come. My, what a, what a rejoicing, what a time when we gather around the throne in heaven. That's just pictured here. Next, you see that Micah tells us of the champion, the shepherd of the sheep in verse 13. Christ's sheep had to be broken free. We could not break the bondage. We could not break free. We had to have someone to come and break us out, to break us out of the prison house. That's what he came to do. To free us from that bondage. The breaker, Micah says, the breaker will go up. The poet said, the breaker, that breaker. He agreed with us who the breaker is. That breaker once made sin to be, broke from the curse his people free. He broke the power of death and hell and cleared the road for his Israel. Now the liberated sheep we see here, they themselves get in on this. He breaks them free, but then he 
empowers them to break free. They shall break through. Speaking of the sheep, the great breaker, our great shepherd and our king, he broke the brass gates down. He destroyed them. But he said, then they break. They break free. They break through. He delivers from sin and bondage, but then he empowers them that he delivers. Did he not say that we would be able to tread Satan under our feet. We have power. We're given it. We receive it from him. We were helpless and powerless. But not only did he break us out, he gave us power. He came into us by the Spirit of God. And we have power, and greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. They then begin to work out their own salvation. So Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. How can we do it? Well, because it's God that worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So as these are broken out, they begin to break through themselves, following the lead of their shepherd, following the lead of the breaker. And he has cleared the way for them but he also must lead the way. And their king shall pass before them, and the Lord shall go at the head of them. He goes before. There's not a single thing facing you in life, beginning with when you were broken out of the bondage of sin. There's not a single thing that you're going to go through that he has not led the way and given you the victory. We walk in his footsteps. Footsteps of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We follow in his steps. He leads the way. He's our great breaker and leader. And he will take us and he will lead us all the way to heaven. He passes before them, and then he goes before them, clearing the way for us. How shall sheep find their way home, except they have someone to lead them? That's why that I think that the Lord chose to liken us to sheep. They are so helpless. Sheep, if you've been around them, and I have, you know that they can get themselves lost, but they can't ever find their way back. You have to go get them. The shepherd had to go. He had to go find the sheep, put it on his shoulders, bring it back home. Then there was rejoicing. But that sheep would have never found its way back. They only are good at getting lost. We got lost, but we need one to find us, and Christ is our shepherd, and he is our king, and he leads his flock. He rules over his church. He leads them, and he protects them. The one that goes before, the kings of old, you know, they led their armies into battle. Christ leads. He protects. He's out in front. The flock is ever advancing. Their royal breaker is leading the way. Conquering now and still to conquer. That's what the hymn writer said, taken from the book of Revelation, and that is true. He clears the path. He lets us follow carefully in his footsteps. As our great breaker, he's the head of the church. His people persevere in holiness. He breaks through. His chosen redeemed ones have broken up. Or better, they will break through. How does it make you feel, Christian, to know that your journey to heaven, in that journey, you're following the breaker's lead? To know that he that leads captivity captive 
has already gone before. We were in captivity, now we're his captives, and he leads us all the way to glory. He's already entered in within the veil, having obtained eternal redemption for us, and now we follow him, we follow his lead, we follow him all the way there. Let the enemy try to cause us to doubt. We know that our Lord has gone on before, leading captivity captive, and even so, he still goes before us, leading us all the way to Zion. I, uh, I'm so thankful that the prophet was moved of the Spirit of God to take a pause from his message of judgment and insert this message of mercy, aren't you? Because we see so clearly the Lord Jesus Christ, our great champion, our great conqueror, the one who destroyed the walls of Babylon and brought us out and gave us power over Satan, over the world, as he indwells us by the Holy Spirit. I love following him, don't you? We can't ever lose following him. I hope you're following him, and if you haven't begun, I hope that the Lord will bring you to give your heart and soul to him. Don't stay in Babylon. He's broken down the gates. Come on out, follow him, and he'll take you all the way to the Father's house.